Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. Start with a prayer, and then we'll get into John chapter 20. As I said, I was surprised when I was putting this together because we've been working and working and working. We went through all four Gospels last week, remember? We went through all four Gospels and took a look at all of the Gospels, the whole passion of the Christ, all the way getting him into the tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And today, the tomb is empty. So let's start with a prayer. Father God, we want to thank you. As we've been going through the Gospel of John, Lord, there are so many things that you continue to teach us. Would you give us a teachable spirit? Allow us, Lord, regardless of how old we are, regardless of how young we are, regardless of how much we think we know these stories, would you just give us a heart that's really receptive? And just just teach us anew. Give us some fresh manna, as some churches mm-hmm. say, some fresh manna um, so that we can be fed by you. And we give you all the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you heard that term before, fresh manna? Sure. Fresh manna. I think that's a, that's a neat term, you know, a neat term. I know a, a pastor friend of mine that always says, I'm going to give you some fresh manna today. <laughs> so that's what it taught me. So let's, let, me, let me go ahead and read this to you. It's, we're, it's, it's most of the, I think it's the entire, no, it's not. It's most of chapter 20, uh, and there's a lot of things that are going on here. So I want to kind of take it easy, but let me go ahead and read what we have for today, if you'll allow me, and we'll go from there. So this starts off with the empty tomb, chapter 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other apostle who was going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down and looked in saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciple went in again to their own, then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary, this is Mary Magdalene, stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And let's stop there. There's just so much in here. I don't even know if we're going to get through these verses. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to see if we can save some, something for, for later. So I have, anybody have, everybody have a lesson plan? Okay. Because I've got plenty. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is the very first words in the verse. That's a good way to start. Don't you know? The good place to start is at the beginning. So in chapter 20, verse one, it says on the first day of the week. The first day of the week. Now, what is the first day of the week? Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. How many people have been around long enough? We'll see how old you really are admitting to. That you remember that on Sundays, everything was closed. 
Gross, right? Everybody, all the hands are up, right? Grocery stores were closed. Drug stores would normally be open because you had to have drugs, right? You had to have something. You had to have the good drugs. You had to have some good drugs. I remember once, this was, this was back in 1975. Carol and I had just gotten married and we went and took our first trip. It was actually our, our honeymoon, even though it was like five months after we had been married. Uh, we couldn't afford a honeymoon until then. So we went, we drove down to Texas and we had a new car, which was nice. Drove down to Texas from Illinois and we were coming back. And as we were coming back, Carol decided that she was going to share some of the driving. Now, truth be told, I just assume drive. I would just assume drive. It isn't that I don't trust her driving. It's just that I stay alert better when I'm driving and I'm not real comfortable sleeping in a car. Mm -hmm. So I just assume drive. But it was probably good that she was driving because I was pretty tired. And we were going to drive, you know, we're young and crazy. So we were going to drive all the way through, right? You know, 18, 19 hour trip from Dallas to Chicago. We're just going to drive all the way through. Well, it was a Sunday. It was a Sunday morning we had left. And so I decided I'm going to go ahead and try to sleep in the passenger side, right? And she's going to be driving along. So mm -hmm. we're, we're driving along and all of a sudden, like, I can feel she's getting off the road. She's getting off the road, but my eyes don't open up. I'm trying to stay asleep, right? But I can feel we're getting off the road and we're bouncing around and then, then we're back on the road mm -hmm. and, and then we're off the road and then we're back on the road. And this happened like two or three times. And I finally opened my eyes and I said, what are you doing? And, and we were, we had less than a half a tank of gas. You know, we were, we needed some gas. And she said, it's Sunday. I'm just checking to see if these gas stations are open because, you know, we're going to need some gas. And I said, we've got 200 miles still, you know, but, but anyway, that's how Carol was, but it was Sunday. And you see back then on Sunday, the gas stations were closed. Things were closed. So I thought what I'd do is I would start this lesson and just talk a little bit about that. Just talk a little bit about that because the scripture says it was the first day of the week. You see, and if you, if you take a look at the scriptures, that first day of the week was very important to the early church. It was not only in here, but you see in the book of Revelation, it says, and I was, on, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's Day is associated as the first day of the week. And that was a very special day. Mm -hmm. And the early church, they didn't call it Sunday. They didn't call it anything. I thought anyth it was Saturday. What? I thought they called the first day of the week Saturday. No, the, the, the Jews did. The, the, Jewish, the, well, uh, the Jewish people observe the seventh day uh -huh. as the Sabbath. Uh -huh. And what you're referring to is that the first day of the week is the Lord's Day, but often, okay, we think of it as the Sabbath, right? But it's not, but it's not. And that's what I thought I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit because I'm a history guy. You know me, I'm, I tell you, I'm, I'm the, I'm the amateur historian, right? And you all know what an amateur is, right? Amateur doesn't get paid, okay? Nobody's ever paid me for this, okay? So eventually sometime, but I'm an amateur historian. I love the history of the church. So I dug into it a little bit, and this is some, some of the research I had done before from my book. So I thought I'd just kind of share it with you. So the, so in the early church, the first day of the week was known as the Lord's Day. That was the Lord's Day. And it was called the Lord's Day because it was a day that the Lord rose from the dead. Which is interesting because we're, we're taking a look. The reason the scriptures are, are being told, remember John told us, he said, I've written these things so that you may know, that you may know that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is the one that came. He is the Messiah. We want you to know that. And part of knowing that is to know the, the chronology, the things that happened. So we went through a very extensive passion of the Christ. We saw Jesus you know, arrested. We see before that he's in Gethsemane and he's praying, that he's arrested. He's, he's brought before Pilate. He's brought before Annas. He's brought before, uh, before the high priest and he's eventually crucified. And it's all very chronically, chronologically laid out. And John wants us to know that it's Sunday morning, what we know as Sunday morning, the Lord's day, early in the morning, and the tomb is empty. Jesus had risen from the dead exactly how he said he was going to, and it was on the Lord's day. So the early history of worship, okay, because we worship typically on Sunday, right? Here at the Windsor, we have two services. We have one at 10 o'clock and we have 11. By the way, Easter's coming, okay? <laughs> now, it's really Resurrection Day, okay, but we're not going to split, you know, that and we're not going to get all frustrated when people call it Easter. But it's really Resurrection Day. Easter Sunday is coming, so we make sure that you invite lots of people because we're going to have two services on that Sunday. We're going to have one upstairs at 10 o'clock in the Stetson Lounge, and then we're going to have one right here 
in this room. And the reason is, is because we've packed out the uh, Imagination Cinema a few times. So we know that we're going to probably have a few more people. So we're going to come in here on Easter Sunday. So that first day of the week was the Lord's Day because the Lord had risen from the dead. Now the early church started having worship services on the, on the Lord's Day. The, for there was two reasons. One is a lot of the early church were Jewish believers. They, they were Jews. And because they were Jews, they would often go to the synagogues. They would, they would observe the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday. And then on Sunday, as Christians, they would gather together. But it's interesting to know that the early church didn't gather on Sunday morning. They actually gathered on Sunday evening. Now, I don't know why, but they did. And we know that because, remember the story of, of, of Paul speaking and somebody fell out the window, okay? Well, that was a Sunday evening. It was a Lord's Day and it was in the evening. And that's when they typically were speaking. They were speaking at night. Maybe it's because the rooms were cheaper at night. I'm not sure. Maybe they were, they were renting a room somewhere and it was less expensive. Who knows? But they were, they were, they were getting together on Sunday night. Now, a couple other things. It had, it had a lot of significance. It had a lot of symbolic significance as well. And we see these from some of the writings of the early church leaders. They were, it was interesting. So for example, they had, uh, not only did Christ re rose from the dead on, on, on Sunday, making it the Lord's day, but there was a couple other things. They actually took it as the eighth day. The eighth day, if you look at the beginning of creation, the eighth day was important. The eighth day was a day that that the law would be fulfilled by the circumcision of a child. And that was done on the eighth day. So the idea of the eighth day was also the day of a new creation. And the fact that Jesus rose from the dead allowed us to be a new creation. We were a new creation in Christ. And so the, the early church identified on this, this Sunday, not as Sunday, but as the Lord's Day, and early church writers would refer to it symbolically as the day of the eighth day, the day of the, of the new creation. So what's interesting is it wasn't until Constantine, and you know Constantine, but knows Constantine was the guy that came along. He was one of the Roman empires and emperors that fought another Roman emperor and finally defeated him. And the thing that was that that he had a heart for Christianity, and most stories say that he became a Christian and he allowed Christianity to be in a period of about forty years. Christianity went from a persecuted religion where people were dying because they were Christians to they were being exalted under Constantine. And during that time, a lot of things happened. He basically um, legalized the church. And within a period of one generation, not only was the church legal, but it became the Church of Rome. It became the official church of the Roman Empire. And a lot of things changed at that time. And one of the things that changed is this whole idea of, of Sunday being a day of, of rest. You see, for three centuries, Sunday was the Lord's Day, and it was a regular work day. It was the first day of the week, like a Monday. Mm -hmm. And people worked. Slaves were doing their business, and the merchants were open, and everything was going on as it always had. It was only the Jewish people that really observed the Sabbath, which was on Saturday. And because many of the, a lot of the Jewish people were merchants, a lot of the stores were closed on the Sabbath day. But Sunday was a regular work day, the first day of the week, until Constantine. Mm. And in Constantine's time, all of a sudden, he made Sunday a day, a, a day of rest. And then after the Reformation, this is back in the 16th century, Martin Luther comes along and John, Mar and, and John Calvin comes along, the English Reformation, where we get a lot of our traditions in the churches, the Western churches, um, Sunday took on a new significance. It became a Sabbath day. So as I said, when we started this conversation, how many people remember everything being closed? Those were what were called blue laws. Mm -hmm. To this day, I don't really know why they were called blue laws. You know, I'm not really sure. I have to look that up sometime. But they were called blue laws, and it means you couldn't get any alcohol, and it was basically a day of rest. And that was because, again, the church had embraced this idea that that was actually the new Sabbath. Now, truth be told, it wasn't the Sabbath at all. The Sabbath has been and always will be Saturday. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday, Sunday is the Lord's Day. And it's a good day for worship, like any day is a good day for worship. But it's not particular just on Sunday, the Lord's Day. This idea of Sabbath, I teach, is a concept of rest. 
that just as God took six days in creating the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, the idea of rest is good. Um, all through the Old Testament, we see that it wasn't just the Sabbath, that seventh day, but there was also every seventh year there was supposed to be a rest. And every 50 years, or seven Sabbaths, there was a year of Jubilee where everybody got to rest. In the book of Hebrews, by the way, the book of Hebrews, it basically says that we as believers have entered into the rest. We've rested, and what we've rested from is actually our works. The Bible says that it's not by works at all, but it's by grace through faith that we're saved. It's not because of the works that we do, but because of what Jesus has already done. So I thought you'd like that. I thought you'd like that. The idea is that the very first, we, by the way, we've only gotten three words so far. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that typical? On the first day, four words. Now on the first day, four words, and we've been talking for 15 minutes, but that's okay. Let's, <laughs> let's go on. But I thought that was interesting, this whole idea. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with people that don't want to cut their grass on Sunday. That's okay. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with people that that rest from their work on, on Sunday. As a pastor, I don't have that choice, okay? Sunday is a pretty busy day for me. Even I've been a pastor now for 19 years, and I can tell you Saturdays and Sundays were some of the busiest days I ever had because our church had two services on Saturday, and we had to get everything all set to go, and then we got to church early on Sunday. Poor My, my poor wife, I drag her along with me, and she'd often volunteer and come along with me. We get to church at 7 o'clock in the morning. We wouldn't get out of there until 2.30, 3 o'clock sure. in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, so that was anything but restful. But the, but the principle, the principle of finding a time to rest, of being able to take some time, and, and it does two things. One, it, it settles us down, it interrupts our days, it interrupts our activities, and it also gives us a time to focus a little bit on the Lord, to be able to rest a little bit, to do some scripture reading, to be able to spend some time with kids and family. That's a wonderful thing to do. It's just not the Sabbath. It's just not the Sabbath. So actually our friends at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they kind of got it right. They, you know, they still worship on Saturdays. They still get together on, on Saturdays. They've kind of got that part right. If you really want to honor God and honor God on the Sabbath, then you do then on Saturday, the seventh day. However, the early church typically worshiped not on Saturday, but on Sunday, which was, which was the Lord's Day. So let's go on. So it was still dark and the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now we're not going to, by the way, there's an interesting study. We're not going to get into it. This whole idea of when the stone was rolled away. And if you look at the scriptures, what's interesting is the stone was rolled away, not so that Jesus would leave. The stone was rolled away so the apostles and the, and the women could look in and see that the tomb was empty. Jesus didn't need the angel to roll away the stone in order to get out, okay? If the God of all creation is going to give life to Jesus Christ, who had died on the cross and died for our sins and bring him back to life with a resurrected body, a stone in front of the tomb is not going to stop him, okay? That stone was removed not because Jesus needed to get out, but so that we could look in and see that it was empty. I thought that was kind of interesting, kind of interesting. So let's go on. So they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. So um, we, we see this, this, this story. Let me turn real quick over here. So Mary Magdalene gets to the tomb, and she, she sees that the tomb is empty. So she runs, and she runs and goes and gets Peter, and along with Peter comes John. John the Apostle. So Mary, she runs away um, and explains that, that to Simon Peter that somebody has taken the Lord. Um, she doesn't understand yet that Jesus has risen from the dead. This is exactly what Jesus had said was going to happen. They, they didn't get it. They didn't get it at the time. They were still unsure, which is really interesting from our perspective. Because from our perspective, we're so used to that. We're so used that Easter Sunday follows Good Friday, that, that after, the res, after the death on the cross, there's a resurrection. And Jesus had said so many times that he was going to rise again, but they, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And we can probably understand that because we just went through the passion of the Christ. And I'm, I'm, I didn't show you a movie, but if you've seen any movies about it, it's, it, lasts, it has an impression on you. 
when you see the Son of God hanging from the cross and blood coming out and the, the horrible pain and the agony and then to be able to take him off the cross and the man is dead. So you can understand why they are forgetting somehow that he's going to rise again. You know, the gospel accounts don't have the disciples all waiting saying, well, just wait till Sunday because he's going to rise again. That, that is in the story that we're told. They're, they're unaware. They, they should be aware, but they're unaware that Jesus was going to rise again. So this is this spectacular moment. So what's interesting is that in the gospel of John, one of the first people we see is, is Mary Magdalene. And that's important. That's very important. This, this concept that women are playing such an important role in the New Testament is a very key concept for a couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus loves women and women have a role to play in the kingdom of God. They're not to be veiled and not to be sitting in the back seat. They're not supposed to be walking five feet behind their husband. They're supposed to walk together in unity that the Bible says there's no longer male nor female, slave nor free, Greek or barbarian, but all are one in Christ. Now, this is a very unique concept. Remember, this is being written 2,000 years ago. Well, it was only 100 years ago. hundred and How long? When was suffrage? When did suffrage go through? Wasn't that like 85 years ago, something like that, that, that women finally got the right to vote in the United States? I mean, when I first started working in industry, if you wanted to buy a car and have it financed, and you were a wife, regardless of your education, regardless of the down payment, regardless of how good your credit was, your husband had to say it was okay. Your husband had to say it was, they had, a they had a sign. Those the, good old days, last those good old days right? <laughs> John saying those good old days, what happened to him? What happened to him? Yeah, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. I'm looking at a room that is full of women, and you are, my friend, are in a lot of trouble. But this is what's spectacular about the Bible. The, the Bible is written 2,000 years ago and has roles for women. The fact that one of the testimonies that's accepted in the Bible is the testimony of a woman who said, I looked in and the tomb was empty. And we say, there you go, there's proof. The woman looked in the tomb and the tomb was empty. In fact, she's the one that ran and told Peter and John. And then they came, but the first person that was there was none other than Mary Magdalene. Okay, this is this is key. I mean, it gives it gives credibility to the scriptures. The fact that the scriptures are going to use the testimony of a woman elevates the status of a woman as well. Okay, um, in fact, it's kind of interesting. Did you know that some scholars? Now, I'm not going to include myself in that for two reasons. One, I hate calling myself a scholar, even though my professor, when I was graduating, said, "Now I am." Okay. But, but I, have, I have a little difficulty with that term. I like being called pastor, uh, but scholar seems a little bit highfalutin for me. But, but did you know that many scholars believe that there was a woman that was one of the apostles? Did you know that? And I'm not talking about some crazy show that was put on TV that talks about Mary Magdalene and stuff like that, and that's not it at all. There's, there's a couple uh, called Juna and Androcus. Juna and Androcus. And they're in the, uh, the book of Romans, and this is what it says. Let's see if I can read it for you. It says, oh, I've got to get my Bible. It's Romans 16, 7. I wrote down the verse, but I didn't write the actual verse. So let me just pull it up for you real quick. Romans 16, 7. And like I said, it's, there's some people believe that, that, that they were apostles and some were not. I'll just read you the verse out of the New King James and you can make your own determination. Romans 16, 7 says this. There's a listing at the end of the book of Romans. Paul, uh, Paul is thanking a lot of people. A lot of people. He gives a lot of credit to a lot of different people. And he says, he says, uh, verse 6, meet, meet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Androcus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Meet Androcus and Junia. Now, scholars will tell you that that's, a, a male name and a female name. Most likely they were married. And Paul says they were in prison, okay, in prison just like I was. They were suffering for Christ. 
They were among the apostles, which is kind of interesting, among the apostles. And he says they were in Christ before me, before me. They were early in the faith. Isn't that interesting? So I'm not going to make a, a point that, you know, they were apostles. We're not going to go into that, that whole idea of, of, you know, who was an apostle and who was. I can tell you this, that the Bible, not only this, but there's probably 17 or 18 names of people that are named apostles. Remember, Paul is one of the apostles, right? Paul was one of the apostles, but Paul came along much later than the other apostles. You know, he was knocked off of a donkey, knocked off of a donkey, and basically went into the desert, and Jesus ministered to him, and Paul says, I'm the least of all the apostles. Timothy is often called an apostle. Barnabas is called an apostle. So it's more than just the 12. It's just more than just the 12. And it very well could be that this, this couple is mentioned. And even if Junia is not a true apostle, She's mentioned by Paul as a fellow laborer, and he's, he's identifying her as, as this, this, this woman that we know, and we don't know much about her except what Paul tells us, but she's mentioned in the Bible. That's, I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so that's just, that's just two. There's a few others. Um, there's a few other women. You have Mary Magdalene. There's another Mary that's also specifically mentioned. And then there's a, there's a, there's a Juna, a Juna that's also mentioned that's supposedly at the tomb as well. If you take a look at all four of the, four of the gospels. So there's a number of women that are involved in this, this early identification of, of the church, of, of, of understanding who, who Jesus was. It's interesting, by the way, that, that Mary is weeping. Mary is weeping. Not only is she weeping because Jesus had died on the cross, but now she's there. The gospel account says that she's basically there to finish the work of anointing the body. And she's wondering when one of the other gospel accounts, who's going to be able to move the stone away so that she can get in and anoint the body. Because this, this process of anointing the body was something that was, that was very, very special. The, the Jews didn't mummify the body like the Egyptians did, but they would wash and anoint the body with, with spices, spices and, and, uh, and ointments and perfumes. And the idea was to giving honor to the body. And of course, the reason they would give honor to the body is because they believed in a resurrection. They believed in a resurrection. So these, these early women in the church, they would anoint, they wanted to anoint the body of Jesus because they believed in a resurrection. Even if it wasn't Easter and the idea of a risen Christ, they were looking forward to it still time that the saints would be able to, to rise again from the dead. So I find that, I find that kind of interesting. So let's go on. So Peter and John run, run to the tomb. So, so Peter's told, so therefore he goes out with the other disciple and they were going to the tomb and they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter. Well, who's the other disciple? It's, it's John. John outran ran Peter. Well, that's understandable, you know. Um, I no longer can run as fast as I could when I was 20, 25. Now, I think, sometimes I think I can, but I can't run as fast as I could when I was 20 or 25 years old. And there's probably a good 20, 20 years, maybe 25 years age difference between uh, Peter and, and John. And you know, that's, don't you know, that's, that's kind of humbling. I'm sure that was kind of humbling for Peter, wasn't it? To know that this other guy's outrunning him, you know? He, Peter, I'm sure, thought of himself as kind of a man's man. We think of Peter as a man's man kind of guy. He's the guy that drew his sword and whacked off the, the ear of the servant of the high priest, you know? Peter's kind of this man's man, and that's probably humbling to think that, that John outran him. The other thing that's nice is that John waits for Peter. John, John waits for Peter um, for a couple of reasons. It could, it could be that John was unsure. John was unsure of his place and unsure whether or not he should go in. Remember, the whole idea of going into a grave is, is, is kind of forbidden by Jews. The whole idea of touching a dead body is, 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 makes you unclean. And, and so the whole idea of a man going in and, and going into a grave is, is something that's, you have to think twice before you do that. Maybe that's what was happening with John. It could be that John was, was giving um, a preeminence to Peter. Peter was the elder. Now, Peter, James, and John were pretty much equal in the church. Peter, James, and John were part of the inner circle. James and John were brothers. But, but Peter was older, and it could be that, that John was waiting for Peter to go in or waiting until Peter caught up before he went in as well. Who knows how far Peter was back? We don't know how far they had to run, you know? If it was a half mile and it was me running, I'd be way back, way back. I'll give you a little, little story, true story. Talk about humbling. I, um, 
I've had a couple of different assignments, and one of the assignments I had was with uh, with Life Church, the church that we use Pastor Craig on Sundays for. Um, great preacher, great church. And the thing about the church is that it's really designed for young people, which is kind of fun when you think about it, that we're doing it here at the Windsor, okay? <laughs> Where the average age of this congregation is a little bit older than the average age at Life Church. It really is. And, you know, sometimes he uses hashtags and Facebook, and we try to figure out what is he talking about. But, but it's a great church, but it's a young church. It's a young church. And I was hired as a pastor in their Nashville <laughs> campus. And I was happy to be there. And I was with about 15, 16 other guys that had the same job. We were all campus pastors. There's now about 30 of those churches, 30 of those campuses. But at the time, there were 15 or 16 of us. And every now and then, they would have us come into Oklahoma and all get together. They were called CPQMs, uh, Campus Pastors Quarterly Meetings, CPQM. And we would come in and, on a quarterly basis and get together with the rest of the church and all the pastors, and we'd kind of sing kumbaya and have fun and, and, and get some instruction at the same time. We'd get to spend some time with Pastor Craig. The other thing they like to do is they like to do sporting events, athletic events. They'd take us out and play baseball or play basketball and things like that. And that was kind of fun. And, and you know, people can tell you that at one time I was, I was pretty athletic. You know, I, I could, I could, I can compete with the best of them. I could run with the best of them. I could swing the bat. I could hit the ball. I could play basketball and do all these things. And I still think of myself as kind of an athlete. Okay. So you can see what's happening. It does happen, right? So we decide they're going to go out and they're going to play dodgeball. You remember dodgeball? You know, dodgeball is a horrible game. Okay. Because what you're doing is you're taking these balls and you're throwing it with all your might at people to try to hit them as hard as you possibly can and knock them out of the game, right? You got two teams, a basketball court, they blow the whistle, you run and get the balls and you start beaning each other with the balls, right? So they all take us to this place and there's there's the 16 of us, which are campus pastors. Along with the 16 campus pastors, there's probably another 10, maybe 12 other staff people, okay? And I look around and I got to tell you, they're all pretty young, okay? I might not be 20 to 30 years older than these guys, but I'm older than most of them, okay? I'm older. There might have been one person there that was about my age, but most of the guys are 25, 30 years old, and I'm in my 50s at the time. So anyway, we're going to play We're gonna play dodgeball. So we're just kind of warming up, and one of the guys comes over, and he says, hey, Ken, he said, you know, you got quite an arm there. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I got quite an arm there. I'm bouncing the ball off the wall, you know, and I, with a lot of speed, you know, man, he said, boy, he said, that's, he said, well, I want you on my team. You know, I want you on my team because, you know, you're throwing the ball really hard. I said, okay, I'll be on your team. So anyway, so the ball, so the, the whistle blows and we're, we're playing. And all of a sudden I realized, you know, when the whistle blows, you're supposed to run to the middle of the court and grab one of these balls and then start throwing at people. And, you know, I used to be quite a runner. I could outrun most of my friends. I think I'll just see how fast I can get out there. Maybe I can, maybe I'll show them that I'm not quite as old as they think I am, right? Well, so the whistle blows and I decide I'm going to take off like a gazelle, right? I take two steps and all of a sudden I feel my hamstring. <laughs> and, and if you could hear it, you could hear this, this rip, okay? This like this, oh this, this like this oh stretch. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I fall to the ground. I'm no more than about eight feet off of the wall. Okay, I fall to the ground in pain. I can't move. I decide I've got to crawl off of this court, okay? Now, the rest of the people are all playing ball, right? And I'm crawling off the, off the court. So I'm an easy target. So the next thing you know, there's guys that are throwing these balls at my head. Just bam, bam, bam. Very humbling. Very humbling. So I say that because I can relate to Peter. I can relate to Peter. So John outruns Peter, and he gets to the tomb first, and Peter goes in there and, and takes a look. So Peter and John go inside, and they, they, they examine the empty tomb. Now, what's interesting in here, it says this. It says, and he, this is Peter, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, this is John. He did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, what's interesting is this, is that when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, what does the Bible says? 
It says that Lazarus came bounding out, okay, still wrapped in all of the claws. And Jesus says, loose him and let him go because he's still all wrapped up. But there's something about the resurrection of Jesus Christ that Jesus came out and all of those linens were still lying there. They were still just just lying there. In fact, the handkerchief around his head, what they used to do is, is the, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, what they would do is they would put claws around the body, almost like a mummy, but not quite. It wouldn't mummify the body. But they would wrap claws around the body. And then the head, what they would do is they would bandage the head and they would put a strap underneath their chin and the reason was is because as rigor mortis sets in, the mouth drops down, okay? And it's kind of unsightly. I mean, not, not that anybody would care, but it's a little unsightly. So what they do to preserve the facial features of the body is they put a strap under the chin and they keep the chin closer and close the mouth, okay? It's like my wife, when I'm falling asleep, she'll kind of shut my mouth, okay? Because she doesn't want me, she doesn't want the mouth dropping open and snoring. She wants me to shut my mouth, shut it up. And that's what was, that's what was happening. So they would put this, in, and people that, that know this custom, they take a look at there and they say, there's something that's being said here about this, this, this linen cloth being folded and being separated from the rest of the body. That's key, that's kind of a, an important element uh, for people that, that understand this. And the idea is this, is that this was not any normal resurrection. The, the body wasn't stolen by anybody, and I think that's why John is including in here. It isn't that Jesus got up and bounded his way out as if he could. It wasn't like a couple people came in and dragged him away. It's that the linen claws that were used in burial were no, no longer needed. They were no longer needed. Jesus didn't need those things. They were discarded. They were set aside. But in an in, in amazing tomb, they weren't just thrown aside. They were neatly folded. And there's something that, there's something I relate to on that. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Also, when you take a look at that, that Simon Peter went into the tomb right away, that also kind of a little telling on Simon Peter. He's kind of an impulsive one, remember? He's always kind of impulsive. You know, when, when nobody else wanted to do something, Peter was going to do it. When, you know, Jesus is walking on the water, Peter's the one that jumps out of the water. He's always ready to say something. And so he just kind of goes right into the tomb and, and just checks it out for himself. So what's, what's interesting is that, again, John is not using his own name, but he says the other one rather than using his own, own name. There's a, there's a humility that John is using for some reason, although you kind of got to look at it two different ways. If you were with us on Sunday, Pastor Craig was talking about, about the Apostle John, and he says, don't you know, I mean, John, Apostle, John, Apostle John is being humble in the fact that he's not using his name, but at the same time, he's always saying, the one that Jesus loved. Okay, the one that Jesus loved is how John is usually referring to himself. And, and it was it, even on Sunday, we said, you know, maybe Peter would be a little upset about that. You know, John's always calling him the, the apostle that that well, Jesus had. That's right. That's right. <laughs> one of the one of the comments I wanted to make, it's not in here, but you've all heard of the Shroud of Turin, right? The Shroud of Turin, uh, this idea of the burial cloth of Jesus. And it's been around for, I think it's something like 800 years. The first time, I mean, there's some people that, that say that it even goes back you know, mention of it, historical mention of it, goes back maybe 14 or 1600 years. But we know for sure for the last eight or 900 years, the church is in possession of something that was very, very unusual, that appeared to be the burial shroud of Jesus. It appeared to be a man somewhere in his 30 years old, um, that had longer hair, that appeared to have been crucified. And there was this image in this shroud of Turin. Well, what's interesting is that with the modern technology we have, with the forensic, you know, everybody watches CSI, right? You see all these amazing things that forensic sciences can do right now. You apply some of those things to the Shroud of Turin, and there's, there's an interesting thing. So this is out of the Evangel Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, which I thought was interesting, because the Catholic Church has been the holder of the Shroud of Turin for all these years. But the Evangelical Church has taken a look at it as well. And they're not as skeptic as you would think they were. In fact, this is what the official dictionary says. It says, the image on the shroud is of a crucified male 
approximately five foot 11 in height, weighing about 175 pounds. His physique was muscular and well-built. He's estimated to be 30 to 35 years old. His long hair is tied in a pigtail in the back, and there's no evidence of any decomposition. So this is fresh. The results of the Shroud of Turin research project in October 1978 determined that the shroud is not a painting, nor does it appear to be a forgery. They determined that his blood is real blood, and that the image seems to be some time of a scorched image, like a negative image, like a photograph would make. They cannot account for how it was made. So they can't confirm that it's the image of Jesus. That would be impossible. But they can't disprove it. There's nothing about the Shroud of Turin that would indicate that it was a forgery of any kind. In fact, if it was a forgery, the fact that it's 800 to 1,000 years at least old, if not much older, they didn't have the technology at the time to be able to do that. What's interesting is that the whole shroud, it looked like it was an image. It wasn't until they actually photographed it with ultraviolet light that a lot of the details that we know in the Shroud of Turin take place, where we actually see, um, we see um, uh, marks of, of a whip in the back, we see a, a, a hole in the side of the, of the body, and we see nail prints in the hands and the feet. So these are interesting things that are in the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go on again with this, this idea of, of, of empty tomb. Um, one of the facts that, that, that this is an empty tomb, this, is, this first part of John signifies that the tomb was empty. We have a story about Mary weeping. We have a story about the apostles running to the to the place, but the fact is the tomb is is empty, empty. And there's a few things that, that, that make sense. First of all, the earliest Jewish arguments against Christ, the earliest detractors of Jesus admit it was an empty tomb. It isn't that the, they believe that he didn't rise from the dead, it's that somebody stole him that the tomb that he was put in is empty, but there's got to be some other explanation other than the fact that he rose from the dead. But they all admit that the tomb was empty. That was part of historical fact. We have records going back to that time, arguments against Jesus as the Messiah that still admit that the tomb was empty. Now, also what's interesting is that the gospel account of Mark, the gospel account of Mark and some of the evidence for this empty tomb, some of the early writings of the church were still during the time of the reign of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest that sentenced Jesus to death. If there was any indication that Caiaphas would try to refute the fact that he had, he had crucified the Messiah, it would have been done. But Caiaphas was unable to refute the fact that the tomb was, was empty. Fourth, the empty tomb is supported by the historical reliability of the burial story. New Testament scholars agree that the burial story is one of the best established facts, not only of Jesus, but the burial story, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is one of the most well-established facts of history. We have more writings, we have more evidence that this story existed than we do of any story of antiquity whether we go back to the Napoleonic Wars or we go back to the founding of Rome or we go to the sack of the the sack of Rome by the Vandals or Attila the Hun or any of those stories, we have more historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that the tomb was empty. One of the other things too is that that empty tomb, that empty tomb was never venerated as a shrine to a dead person. It was always the empty tomb. It was always the empty tomb. You know, you can go to, you know, I, I grew up in Illinois. I can go to Illinois. I can go where, you know, Abraham Lincoln is buried. You can go to Grant's tomb. You know, you can go to different places where people are buried. And it's kind of a shrine, depending on how historically significant that individual was. But the empty tomb was always the empty tomb. It was it was never, never a burial place. Um, the, another thing, the tomb was discovered empty by women. Why is this important? Because the testimony of women in the first century Jewish culture was considered worthless. Okay, the fact that that the tomb was was discovered by women that it is included in the testimony 
actually makes it more credible. And the reason I say this is that if you go into a court of law and let's just say there's a robbery, something that happens, and you get four or five witnesses, and every witness says exactly the same thing, word for word, the court will throw out the testimony. They'll throw out the testimony. What they want is they want casual observers. They want the story told from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. The fact that there's women that are testifying to the story actually makes it more credible than if it was fabricated. You see, if it was fabricated, they never would have put women in the story. The reason women were in the story is because women were in the story. Women were in the story. Mm -hmm. So let's go on. So the Bible says, for they as yet did not know the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. You see, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but it was gonna be very difficult for them to truly believe that he was going to completely rise from the dead. So let's, let's turn to uh, verse 11. We're going to see Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, by the way, in, depending on the church, um, identifies her very, very highly in the high regard. In the Catholic Church, Mary Magdalene is, is, is pro- one of the primary characters. Other than the Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene is probably one of the primary characters in this resurrection story. Mary Magdalene we see early in the Gospel of Matthew. Mary Magdalene was most likely a prostitute, had a number of different demons, and Jesus cast the demons out, and Mary Magdalene became a very faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, Depending on the Gospel accounts, she is definitely one of a key three or four women. So Mary Magdalene is identified by John and is seen here. It says, Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and then she saw, she wept, she stooped on and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels. Now, what's interesting is that those two angels are there for Mary. Peter had been there. Peter and John had been there. They have no story of the angels. The angels are there for Mary. Just like I said before, the stone was rolled away, not for Jesus, but so that people could look into an empty tomb. These angels are there particularly for Mary Magdalene. They're not there for Peter and for John, but they are there for Mary Magdalene. And they say to her, women, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away the Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, what's interesting is that the angels don't have any further conversation with her, but they're there, and I think they're there for a very important statement. They're there to let her know that there's something that's supernatural that has happened. There's something that are super, there's something supernatural going on here. Peter and Jay, and Peter and John looked in the tomb and then ran back, okay, and I saw the empty tomb. And to them, the fact that the tomb was empty was all they needed to know. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot they have to know. But that was enough for them and they left. Mary Magdalene, two angels appeared to her. And Mary Magdalene is going to, going to let this settle into her and she's going to start understanding there's something very supernatural that's happening. She recognizes them as, as angels. Now, Mary didn't notice the burial wrappings through the curious arrangement. However, there were the two angels that were, that were, that were there uh, with her. The presence of the angels was at that time kind of, uh, a side note, okay? The most important thing for her was that the that the Lord was missing. Now, she attributes that his absence doesn't necessarily mean a resurrection because you see, she then sees Jesus. Jesus is in the, in the garden. She thinks he's the gardener and she asked them if he knows where somebody took the Lord, okay? So it's interesting. And this is, this is what's called, this is what's called revelation, okay? The revelation of the gospel is being taken place. Revelation is nothing more than it's being revealed to her. And if you notice, each one of these apostles, each one of these these people that knew Jesus, they're absorbing this information as they go. They're absorbing the information as they go. They don't know what they don't know. And here's here's the point. As believers, we are the same way. We're going to know what we need to know when we need to know it when we need to know it. There's a time in my life when all of a sudden I realized that, oh my goodness, I had been been taught this all my life, but I never really allowed it to go much further than my head. I needed to get it way deep inside me that Jesus had actually died on the cross for me. This was not just a historical fact. 
This wasn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago, but it was real. It was real in that he had died for, for me. And so as a result, I started to change. And God has given me over the last 35 years revelation. God has allowed me to grow. And it's the same thing that we're saying here with Peter and James or Peter and John and Mary, they're going to have the revelation they need at the time to allow them to get to where God wants to to bring them. She did not know that it was Jesus. Mary certainly knew who Jesus was, and that's what's interesting. Here is somebody that's standing there, okay, and she didn't know it was Jesus. It was strange that she didn't immediately recognize him. Some think it was because she was emotionally distressed and had tears in her eyes. You know, others speculate that it was because Jesus looked somewhat different. And there's been a lot of speculation about that because there's a few other places. You remember there's a, there's a conversation with two men that are walking along the road and Jesus comes along and starts talking with them and they're surprised that he didn't know what had happened in Jerusalem. So they're telling the story of, of Jesus and Jesus is basically then telling them the story of the Bible. And they still don't recognize him until he sits down and he breaks bread with them. And for some reason, their eyes are opened at that time and they recognize Jesus. So here's the, here's the hope. Here's the hope. I don't think it's that Jesus was camouflaging himself. I think that the idea of the resurrection and the glorified body of Jesus Christ is so spectacular that even though we will eventually be able to recognize each other, we're not gonna be quite the same. And I look forward to that. (laughs) I look forward to the time that there's a new improved me, that there's a new improved me. Because no matter how hard I try, I never am quite satisfied that this is not the new improved me, okay? In fact, the older I get, the worse I become, okay? I, have, you know, I, just, I just don't have, I don't have the looks, I don't have the strength. I've already told you I can't run as fast, okay? Faith, man. I know, I, I'm increasing my faith. There's going to be a time when I'm the new, improved me. And I think that's part of it. I think it's, it's part of a number of things. I think the fact that she, you know, sometimes you see somebody at a grocery store, And you know that you know them, but you can't remember where because they're out of place and out of time. You're not expecting to see them at the time. You kind of recognize them, but you don't quite recognize who they are. And then they start talking to you and they, oh, of course, how how couldn't I have recognized you? It's you, Don, of course I know who you are. I see you all the time. You're just out of place. You're not in the right place. And I think part of it is that as well. Um, But I'm still looking forward to the, the new improved me. So what was interesting also is that Jesus said to her, Mary, there's something about the voice that Mary recognized. If it wasn't the the appearance of Jesus, if it wasn't that she recognized him from looking at him, she would recognize his, his voice. And I love that. You know, you've probably experienced that yourself, that sometimes you'll hear a voice and it's like, wait, I, I know that voice. I, I recognize that voice. You know, it's it's kind of fun on the phone is that sometimes we don't see who's calling and before the days of caller ID, you pick up the phone, you'd say hello, but as soon as somebody started talking to you, you'd recognize the voice. And I love that that there's a there's that 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 voice of the Lord that Mary was able to recognize. And the thing that I like is that means that, that she spent enough time with him. Think about it. She spent enough time with him that she recognized his voice. You know, there's many, many people that could have picked out Jesus from the crowd, okay? You know, they could have said, that's who Jesus is. You know, he, he was the one that was preaching. He was the one that was on the, the mountain. He was the one that was in the boat while we were all sitting there listening to him. And I know what he looked like. But Mary had spent enough time with Jesus that she recognized that simple word, Mary, when he said her name. And the other thing about that is that means that she had said her name before, that's glorious when you think about it. I mean, that puts her in a very, very special position. I don't know how many people Jesus had used their name enough that they would actually recognize that it was the voice of the master when he said her name. You know, I keep, I keep hoping that that will be sometime true for us, that the Lord will actually speak our name and that we'll be able to be called by our name 
and they would be able to recognize his voice. That would be a glorious time, wouldn't it? That'd be a wonderful thing for us to happen. It really would be. So let's go on. I just want to get into this, this little piece here. It says, it says, um, <clears throat> Jesus said to her, so, so, so Mary grabs a hold of Jesus, right? <clears throat> and Jesus says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And that's why it's recorded because she told this to John. That's why it's here because John had, had actually heard this from Mary Magdalene. So there's a couple of things that, that, are, that are key with this. And I want to cut through some of the mystic stuff. You know, there's, there's people that, that, that teach that Jesus was some kind of phantom at the time, that he was not supposed to be touched. He was untouchable. And there's some people that actually teach that she couldn't touch him. You know, it's like he was, he was like a, this 3D image, you know, this hologram of some kind. People actually teach that. But that's, there's nothing further than the truth. I mean, that's not true. There is an interesting account of what happened from the time that Jesus died on the cross to the time that he rose on Sunday. And that's an interesting story. We don't have enough time to get into it. Maybe if you want to, I'll pick it up next time we, we get together. Because that's an interesting story. And I think sometimes people misunderstand that. But if we take a look at all of the scriptures, including some of the New Testament scriptures as well as the Old Testament scriptures, we get an idea of what Jesus was doing. And Jesus wasn't just lying in the tomb waiting until Sunday. There was something that was very, very special that was happening. The, the Apostle Paul says that absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if that's true with us, then for sure, Jesus had something going on from Friday until until Sunday. Those 40 hours, there's there's something that was happening. And uh, I think we'll just get into it next week. But that's that's an important thing. That you know, he says, Jesus says this. He says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. And I'll leave you with this. Jesus doesn't say that I'm ascending to our Father. He's saying I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. Jesus is making a distinction about his relationship with he and the Father. Remember, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one. There's a special relationship between Jesus and his Father. Now, it just so happens that's the same Father that we have, the Lord God. But Jesus is making a distinction that this is, he's ascending to my Father, who is also your Father. My God and your God as well. Isn't that cool? I love that. So let me close in prayer, and then if there's any more questions, we can talk about them, and we'll go from there. Father God, we want to thank you. It's just amazing, Lord. Now, as we get into John chapter 20, we have an empty tomb. And Lord, that just, that just makes us smile. And we know that at this point in the scriptures, the apostles and the rest of the people don't even know what's miraculous that's happened. But Lord, we thank you, Lord, for these scriptures. We see the beginning of the birth of the church. We see now what's happened, that Jesus has actually risen from the dead. The scriptures have been fulfilled, and we give you all the praise and the glory for that. So, Lord, we look forward to the next couple of weeks being able to finish this up and get ready for a Resurrection Sunday when we get to celebrate this again. And we give you all the praise for that in Jesus' name. You've been name. listening to Faith Amen. Dialogue with Pastor Amen. Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of faith dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.